Thanks, Barbara. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sam James, and welcome to this SIWEM webinar on modeling the Brumadino tailings dam failure and subsequent loss of life webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping rules and introductions before we get started with Darren and Mark. Um, so the meeting will be recorded, so and they will be put up on the SIWEM website after the event. Um, I think Barbara is going to copy that link into the chat. Moving on to the chat. So if you're having any technical difficulties with um, sound or video or anything to do with Zoom, please use the chat functionality at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For any questions relating to the content that Darren and Mark are going to be presenting, please use the Q&A facility. So chat for technical issues with Zoom and then Q&A for questions regarding the content. Um, there's one hour of CPD attributable to this webinar, um, but unfortunately, SIWEM can't provide those CPD certificates, but you can claim one hour of CPD for this. Um, in terms of Q&A, if there's any Q&A questions that come in that you particularly want answering or like, there is the option to like those questions to bump those up to the top. So I'll be reading through those at the end of the presentation. So this webinar is being presented by the SIWEM Rivers and Coast Group, of which I'm a member. So I'm here at the chair today. Um, the RCG, Rivers and Coast Group, we're running a series of bite-sized webinars, which are kindly being hosted by SIWEM. And this is the first one of those bite-sized webinars, just giving us broad an introduction to the kind of things we do as a special interest group at SIWEM. Um, the RCG aims to be the lead professional body covering the sustainable management of rivers and coastal environments. So that's been thanks to RCG for hosting that and SIWEM for helping out as well. So again, a bit about SIWEM. Um, for those who may not be so familiar, we've completely switched to the virtual world now and embraced um, home working. We're reaching out to an absolutely huge global audience, providing relevant and accessible events um, to our community working in the water and environment sector. So the link is there between local, national and international, which is the beauty of these webinars. So we can access the whole world. We've switched completely virtual with that. Um, it's important to notice well that SIWEM declared a climate and ecological declaration at the end of 2019 um, and there's two events that I want to draw your attention to um, which is COP26 which is being held in Glasgow this year from the 1st to the 12th of November 2021. Uh, Barbara will put a link to that in the chat and a um, COP2015 COP15, which is being held in China that's 17th to 30th of May 2021. So I'll draw your attention to those and Barbara will kindly provide those links. A few other events and activities are coming up. So some things to stick in the diary and um, various branch events. There's Flood and Coast coming up um, on the 14th of April, 2021. Um, there's a climate action plan for Island Case Study Initiatives webinar, which is coming up on the 10th of March. And uh, there's a couple of other webinars to do drainage and wastewater management plans and uh, a novel method to estimate the risk to people by floods as well. So some really interesting webinars coming up as well, which Barbara again will put in the chat for you to follow up. So I'd encourage you all to attend those as well. There's also mentor training as well coming up by SIWEM as well. Um, you can go to the link on the SIWEM website, which I think Barbara will then put some links in there and dates as well. So getting onto the topic of this webinar, uh, welcome. We're all here representing the RCG. We also work for uh, HR Wallingford Limited. Uh, Darren, Mark, and myself, we all work for HR Wallingford. Um, HR Wallingford, we're a specialist research and consultancy that specializes in solving the world's most complex water related challenges. We are non for profit, which means that we reinvest all our profits into strategic research. Um, we have particular expertise on dams and smart data solutions, which is a nice fusion of what this talk will be about. So, using Earth observation data to look at dam breaches and uh, modeling of those breaches. So we've got Darren presenting. He's a technical director at HR Wallingford. He has over 18 years experience with hydrological, hydraulic and water resource studies in the UK and overseas. And Mark, our second panelist, he's got over 16 years experience in with particular expertise in hydrological 1D and 2D river and catchment modeling on a wide range of projects. Um, again, any questions throughout Darren and Mark's talk, please use the Q&A facility below, not the chat. Chat, please try and keep to um, keep to uh, technical issues in Zoom. And please, if you could all stay on mute as well, that would be fantastic. 
Um, so I'll just hand over to Darren and Mark. Thanks, both. Thanks, Sam. So thanks for, for the Rivers and Coastal Group at Southern for inviting us to speak. Uh, so we do this as a bit of a double act. So I'll I'll start off. Um, and so this talk is focused on the Rumandinho tailings dam failure and the, the subsequent loss of life. And this event occurred in, in Brazil just over two years ago. But before we get on to the actual incident itself and, and, and the work that we carried out, I thought it was useful to give you a bit of background to, to what is a tailings dam. So tailings dams are generally earth embankments. They can be very big structures. They can be several kilometers long, sometimes up to 200 meters in height. Um, and that photo in the right of the slide, that shows you the Syncru tailings dam in Alberta in Canada. That's for oil sands mining. And that's a really enormous structure. It's, I think it's 18, around 18 kilometers long, varies in height between about 45 and 90 meters. So they can be very big. They're primarily used to store the byproducts of mining. And generally it's for permanent storage. So that's forever in perpetuity, this residue for mining needs to be stored. And although not all of the byproducts are toxic, some of them, or in fact, many of them are, you get heavy metals, iron oxide, things that aren't good for the environment and people. So um, some of what's stored behind these dams are, can be toxic. And there's a lot of these structures around the world. Now, it, it depends which source you read. I, I put three and a half thousand tailings dams there worldwide with a, a big question mark. There was recently another study that said there was about 10,000. And then you read other papers that suggest there's 10,000 tailings dams alone just in China. So there's not really a reliable global inventory of, of tailings dams. So, so there's, but there's lots of them. There's, there's, there's a larger number of them. And they pose um, significant risk. And one of the reasons they pose significant risk is that they've got, relatively speaking, for such a high consequence structure, they've got relatively high probabilities of failure if you look at the historical data. So there's some research suggests that the annual probability of failure of tailings dams is about 1.2%, so just over one in 100. Whereas for water retaining dams, you know, hydropower dams, irrigation dams, water supply dams, it's significantly less that probability of failure. So, you know, you, you wouldn't really want to be living downstream of one of these big dams if it had a one in 100 year or one in a hundred chance each year of failing, especially if you look at that photo in the right, that's a tailings dam which failed in 2010 in Hungary. Uh, that resulted in the deaths of, I think, 15 people in a village downstream, released a lot of waste, which was primarily, I think, iron oxide, which led to contamination of, of rivers. So they are very dangerous structures. So it sort of begs the question, why do they have a higher probability of failure than water retaining dams? And there's, there's various, reasons that are put forward by the experts and it may be a combination of these so lack of rigorous design regulations uh, sometimes the embankments are constructed from less than ideal materials often the embankments used in states in tailings dams are steeper than the water retaining dams and also their tailings dams are dynamic structures generally they're raised fairly frequently as we see in the Brumandinho case and that can result in zones of lower shear stress in the structure. There's another reason, which is more maybe an organizational and institutional one, is that there's sometimes a lack of clarity over who's responsible for tailing dams. So it's not unusual sometimes for small mining companies to go bankrupt and then leave the infrastructure in place. So there are parts of the world where there's a number of tailing dams that have been abandoned or orphaned. And no one's really got responsible for them or they end up being the responsibility of the government. And, and there are indeed cases where it's not always obvious where certain tailings dams are. In terms of construction, this slide shows the three main construction techniques for, for tailings dams. Um, it's a, a cross section through a tailings dam and the impounded tailings. So you've got the impounded tailings on the left. And the three main methods are the upstream construction, downstream, and the centerline construction. And the upstream construction method, which is the one on the top, you can just see just by inspection, by looking at that slide, that it uses the, the least amount of material 
and thus it has the lowest cost generally. Um, but if you, if you read uh, geotechnical reports or look at geotechnical experts and what they say about upstream construction of tailings dams, there's, there's one quote which says they're unforgiving structures, which means that if you have poor design or bad construction, improper construction or poor operation and maintenance, then they can be uh, subject to catastrophic failure. And you can just see, again, sort of just by inspection that intuitively the upstream construction method tailings dams look less stable than the ones that have been constructed using the downstream and center line construction method. Now, I, I, my understanding is that upstream construction methods aren't used now that frequently for new tailings dams. But as I said, these structures are, are built to be there in perpetuity forever. And so there's a number of these structures which have been built using upstream construction methods um, in place. So we now look at, at, at the Brumandinho tailings dam, and this is a cross section through the Brumandinho tailings dam, which is located in Brazil. Um, the actual name of it is the, the dam B1 of the Corregor de Bejo uh, um, mine in, in Brazil, but it's generally referred to as the Brumandinho tailings dam. Um, when it failed, it was uh, about just over 86 metres high. Uh, the crest length was about 700 metres. And you can see it was, it was raised in nine stages. So there was a, an initial dam, and then it was raised over a period of about 37 years. Uh, the last time it was raised was in 2013. And the last tailings deposit was made in 2016. So after 2016, there was no further tailings deposits. Um, and it, it stored around 12 million cubic meters of, of tailings from the, from the dam site. And um, it had been based by the Brazilian authorities had stated it had a low probability of failure. Um, but this is what happened on the the 25th of June, 2019, at lunchtime, 12.28. You can see that this failure was very rapid. This is in real time. So this is quite a frightening video. This is the, the dam actually failing, some footage from the video cameras. And it basically released a, a mud flow that was up to 10 meters deep and also moving in, in some estimates very quickly. So of the order of, um, some people say 30 meters a second, so that's over 100 kilometers an hour. Um, and around 9.7 million cubic meters of the 12 million cubes of tailing was released. So most of the tailings were released. Um, so I'll just play this again. Um, and the official reason, there's been a report into this, which is in the public domain, was published in December 2019. The reason for the failure was given a static liquefaction. So that's when you get a sudden loss of strength of the soil and caused essentially by the sudden loss of the, the effective stress. And, and that, that leads to large deformations, uh, rapid buildup in, in pore water pressure. And basically the soil begins to act like a liquid. So that's what happened. You can see from the video that the, the failure started at the top. And um, after the, the failure was initiated, initiated then there were further failures of the tailing um, and and that led to this massive mud flow downstream which took about from anecdotal evidence and, and eyewitness statements probably one and a half to two hours to move to the downstream river but but we'll get on to that so this was a a, a really a, a tragic event in that um it led to significant loss of life. So it led to um, between about 270 and maybe just over 300 deaths um, downstream, mainly of the miners who were in the canteen having their lunch. Significant damage to, to the environment. This slide shows you the difference between the uh, before and after satellite pictures. You can see that with the mud flow and also large economic losses. And this wasn't the first failure of a tailing dam in Brazil. Um, since 1986, there's been about 12 tailings dams, significant tailings dams that have failed that have led to over 1,000 people losing their lives, significant damage to the environment, and then as a consequence, significant 
loss of livelihoods for people who live along rivers that have been affected by these failures. So this slide shows you a, a map of the, the Brumandinho tailings dam. So um, you've got the brown is the, the outline or the maximum extent of the mud flow caused by the failure. The A up here is where the Brumandinho tailings dam was. B was a, a water reservoir for um, processed water. C was um, where the mine offices were and the canteen. And as I said, it was lunchtime. So many of the workers were there. And D is a railway bridge that was washed away. So if you put that in perspective, you look at this photo, this shows you these places. So that's the railway bridge there that you can see has been washed away. That's where the mining offices were. Uh, that's the process water reservoir, which was badly damaged, but remained intact. And that's where the Brumandino tailings dam was. So we flick between the two, you can see those key points um in the in the failure so one question we sometimes get asked because this can be quite i suppose a morbid stud, um, a subject discussing a loss of life in these structures is is, is why do we model loss of life and, and also evacuation times for tailing stands so one of the reasons to do it is to look at how the number of fatalities is affected by the efficiency of of, of warnings how well they're they're disseminated um, whether we can reduce the loss of life by using safe havens and refuges, um, how the different evacuation routes and modes of transport, you know, car or on foot, affect the fatalities. And so you can assess the risk to people and that evacuation times. But I think the overarching goal is really to improve emergency planning and risk assessments for these structures. So you don't get these tragic accidents that happen, or if they do happen, you minimize the risk to people and to the environment and to people's livelihoods. So I'm, my, Mark and I are gonna talk you through what we did in terms of the modeling. Um, and there was essentially, to break it down, in, it, there were three steps to the modeling. So the first one was to estimate the mud flow hydrograph following the, the tailings dam failure. So, how do we do this? Well, we've at HR Wallingford over the years, over probably the last 30 years, we've done a lot of research into embankment breaching, embankment dam breaching. And we've got a number of bits of software, but we hadn't really done any work into tailings dams. But a colleague of ours who developed one of the breach models has produced a, something called Embraer Mud, which is a two fluid um, breaching model for dams. So normally you have a water layer, which is uh, Newtonian flow. But this model has got two fluids. So one, it's got the water and it's also got a mud layer. So a kind of a visco plastic flow. And we use this to get the hydrograph shape. Now, at the time, the volume that had been estimated by various experts, volume of tailings that had been estimated to, to have been released by the dam was lower than the subsequent estimates. So we basically used Embraer Mud to get a an idea of what the shape of the mud flow hydrograph was. And then when the detailed expert report came out in December 2019 and said that about 9.7 million cubes, which was significantly more than it had been initially estimated of tailings had come out, we adjusted the hydrograph volume. So um, there is a lot of uncertainty, of course, in this hydrograph, but again, it was tweaked to get our best estimate. And, and you know, this, this was the best we could do with quite limited information so that was the first step uh, the next step was to model the the mud flow to um, using that mud flow hydrograph we use mike a mike 21 2d mud flow model uh, we'd originally done some modeling uh, using some very coarse digital terrain model data a 30 meter um, grid which was freely available digital terrain model from one of these global models um, but we then for this study we got some higher resolution data from Airbus, which is a 12 meter DTM. And this slide shows the um, observed mud flow extent from the model, or, or the sort of model mud flow extent with the observed mud flow extent. And it is fairly similar, but you'd expect that it's quite a steep valley, but um, it, it was important to get the modeling of the mud flow at a reasonable um, temporal interval. And then the third step was modeling the risk to people. So there's a number of simple methods that are often employed to, to model risk to people. They can be simple equations that say, well, if there's 
a hundred people in the path of the flood or the mud flow, then X percent of them are likely to die. But what we've done over the years is develop something called the life safety model, initially um, uh, developed by BC Hydro in British Columbia and Canada to do risk assessments for the hydropowers um, dams. Um, and this is what's known as an agent-based model, um, which determines the fate of each person. So each person, building and car in the model is, a, is known as an agent. So they have rules and they interact with each other and they interact with the flood water. And uh, it's been validated for a number of large events. So on the right, you can see Malpasse Dam in the south of France, which failed in 1959. It's been validated for that. And in the lower photo, you can see Canby Island. There was a big flood there as a failure of the, as a result of the failure of the flood defences in 1953 from a coastal surge, and we've used it to that, and you get quite good results. Um, the the idea isn't to to get. You're never going to be exactly accurate with the the number of loss of life estimates because. Um, because there's so much uncertainty. The, the purpose of using these models is to see, does an emergency management intervention, such as putting refuges in, improving warnings, adding additional evacuation routes, make a significant difference to the loss of life? Is it an order of magnitude change? And then you can probably say with some confidence that this is a worthwhile intervention. So I'll, I'll now hand over to Mark, who talk us through the application of the life safety model to the the Brumendinho case study. Thanks, Darren. I'll go through in the uh, next few slides to um, show how we set up the life safety model and a bit more information about it. So essentially the life safety model interacts um, people with the mud flow. Um, it was initially developed, as Darren said, by BC Hydro and to look at um, water dam, so it was interaction of people with um, flood flows from uh, potential dam failures. Um, we wanted to apply it to the Brumadinho case to see how it would, um, one, see how well it would work um, for mud flows and also to then investigate some different evacuation scenarios um, as what if scenarios um, to look at what um, as we could have been done. The model is um, set up to have the people in the flood risk area, the buildings and the road and trail network. We had estimates of the number of people on the mining site from news reports following the incident in 2019. We setting the model up with uh, assuming 200 people in the canteen area and then a further 200 spread over the mine site, the most, the majority of which we placed in the office buildings um, around the canteen area at the south end of the site. Um, and then we also assumed a, a sort of all the residential buildings in the villages downstream of the site to have two people in each building. Yeah. So this um, map shows how the model was set up spatially. So the white squares are the locations of the buildings. The gray lines are the road network and the black lines are um, trails or footpaths that can be used by pedestrians but not by vehicles in the model. Um, the evacuation model works by um, sending people towards safe havens which were the green, dot, uh, green triangles on the previous slide. Then to interact the people with the mud flow the model uses the um, results um, through space and time from the um, 2D mud flow model, which in this case was the Mike 21 model. So this um, shown as a simple gridded um, sketch, you have the um, depths and the velocities um, through space and time. So as the event unfolds, the 
um, mud flow spreads out across the domain and the um, depths and velocities increase with the flood wave. And then at the bottom image shows how the um, evacuation model objects being buildings, roads and people overlay on that grid. And then at each time step, the um, results from the mud flow model are interrogated um, at the locations of buildings, people and vehicles, and the um, depths and velocities at that time interval are um, interrogated for those using a loss function, which is shown on the following slide. So here we have um, the sort of general form of the loss function in the model. It relates the um, depths, and velocities, and the product of depth and velocity um, to statuses for each object. The at the low, low depths and low velocities, in terms of people, they assume that the um, people are stable and they're able to move through the flow. And then as the depths and velocities increase, those people would be um, knocked off their feet or forced to swim or wade through as the depths increase at low velocity, but as the combination increase, it's more knocked over and then at much higher values, um, any people within the mud flow are uh, treated as fatalities. The um, sort of parameters that control those functions are set in the, um, for each individual object in the model. So you can um, vary those depending on the physical characteristics. So in the case of buildings, the different types of construction would have more resistance to flows than others. And similarly with people in terms of stability, there's fairly good evidence for stability of people in water from flume experiments that are used to define the curve between the green and the yellow. This slide shows the um, results of the model run for the no warning case. Um, the results have been aggregated so at different locations for display purposes. Um, the size of the circles show the number of people at each location and the colors relate to their status. So the purple dots are representing people who are outside of the hazard mud flow extent and unaffected. The orange dots are people who were within the mud flow and were knocked over or injured, um, but managed to, to escape in the end. And the green ones are people who escaped from the mud flow. The red circles represent the fatalities. So um, here showing the majority of the fatalities are in the lower part of the mining site. And then at two, the unnamed small villages um, alongside the river within one to two kilometers of the um, dam also had fatalities. The larger village um, about between six and eight kilometers downstream had a number of buildings along the edge of the river, many of which were destroyed. And we, the model gives a few fatalities there. But, um, the majority of the people there um, are a, were able to escape because of the time of travel between the um, dam and the village. This is an animation from the model um, for a warning, assuming a warning issued at the time of failure. So the yellow dots um, represent people fleeing from the mud flow towards the safe locations. Um, where the dots turn red, they're ones that don't escape from the mud flow um, become fatalities. Uh, thanks, Mark. So um, the, the overall results of the modelling, um, kind of what, the, what did it tell us? So these are 
this is a table of the of the scenarios we modeled so on the left you've got the the amount of warning that the people got this is in the model before the failure of the dam and the number of fatalities at different places so basically we, we split them up between the villages and the mining site so you know it, it, it's, it was self-evident that there were a lot of people at risk in in the uh, in the canteen and the in the works but what's quite interesting that if if you look at this this red block that i've highlighted if you were able to give a warning at the point the breach happened and people knew where to go you could still reduce the the, the loss of life almost basically downstream but i uh, fairly significantly and certainly very significantly in the villages downstream and, and the other thing we did was looked at different warning times to see what warning time do you need to get the number of fatalities down to zero and and the model showed that um that if there was a warning time of 15 minutes in advance then all the people downstream of the structure could get out of um not be at risk so um that's the difference in, in the in the warning time at the breach. And this is, if you look at this, it's 15 minutes. If you had a 15 minute warning before failure, then you could reduce the fatalities to zero potentially. So the other thing the model tells us is how long people had to escape. So this um, um, slide shows you the, again, the, the as Mark said, the, the, uh, the white squares of the buildings, the green triangles of safe havens, but then we've got the times on it. So people, I mean, it, it's obvious, I know, that the nearer you are to the dam, the less time you have to escape, but it gives the emergency planners some idea of actually how much time you've got. So if you're down here, you've got at least 45 minutes. So there may be type of warning system, might be quite a simple warning system that could easily give people 45 minutes um, advance warning if the dam fails. That's another thing that you get out of the, of the model. So how else does it help? Well, there's, there's quite an interesting book that was written a few years ago by a guy called Lee Clark um, called uh, Mission Improbable, Using Fantasy Documents to Tame Disasters. And he has this, this hypothesis that um, having analyzed a number of disasters, not just um, dam failures, but nuclear power uh, accidents, a whole range of natural disasters and technological disasters that many emergency plans as, as what he calls fantasy documents so what he means why he says fantasy documents it is basically his hypothesis is that it's easier to produce something that's not very realistic than to actually truly assess the risks and be very forthright about what the uncertainties are so to summarize what he says are, are the characteristics of, of, of fantasy documents or fantasy emergency management plans is that they make statements that you can't be fulfilled. Um, they often simplify the event so that, you know, the way the event's being planned for is, is very controlled. They don't consider various socioeconomic and human factors, such as, you know, age, gender, culture, uh, disability, socioeconomic status, and how they affect people's responses. Um, the risks aren't often very well assessed and not very rigorously assessed. And, the simplicity of everything, you know, including how society um, reacts to things and how events unfold is, is often made to be far too simple. So this is something that's, that's common, as I said, not, not just to tailings dams, emergency management plans, but emergency management plans for a whole raft of different hazards. So the other thing that the, the, the life safety model gives you is, is a much more robust estimate of risk than you would get from a very simple model. So this slide here shows um, you know, what some of you may be familiar with, where you've got an annual probability of an event happening, in this case, failure on the y-axis, and then the number of fatalities. And this is from the health and safety executive, but there's a number of these graphs used around the world as to how you define where is risk, where, where, where does an organization or government feel happy with risk? And this one defines this area here as the lowest reasonably possible area or ALAR area um, in terms of major accidents. So ideally you want to be in here. So if you've, got, um, if you've got a very high consequence, thousands of lives and the probability of the accident, whether it's a tailings dam failure or a nuclear accident should be very low. But if you look at the Brimandino dam, that red spot, it's probably up here because, you know, it, as I said, they've, they've got about this probability of failure. I don't know. I mean, this is just a guess as that probability of failure. 
and the loss of life was hundreds. So even if it was, you know, even if it was an order of two orders of magnitude uh, less the annual probability of failure, it's in an area where most organizations would not be happy with that risk. It also tells you, as I said, it gives you help with evacuation. So after the Brumandina tailings dam failed, um, this is the water processing reservoir adjacent to it. And you can see that the toe was quite badly damaged. And at the time there were, there were fears that, um, that that would also fail. And, and actually there was a very effective evacuation um, organized as far as I can work out from the, the anecdotal data or information that's available that, you know, there were sirens set up and people did evacuate because they knew what to do. So the other thing you might be asking yourself is how do you increase warning times? You know, the Brumandinia tailings dam was monitored. Many tailings dams that are run by big mining companies are monitored. Is there, are there possibilities to increase warning times to look ahead more? Because as I said, the modeling showed that you'd need at least 15 minutes for everyone to evacuate for all the miners to get out of the area at the risk and all the villages. Well, one possibility is, is using satellites. So over the last decade or so, the accuracy of synthetic aperture radar, which can measure um, deformations of structures, has got better and better. So um, we've been doing some work to, to look at the possibility of um, using uh, satellites to monitor deformation of dams. So we've got a, a, a project called DAMSAT, and this is some work that we've done in, in Peru. So I've anonymized this, but this is a tailings dam in Peru. Um, so you see the tailings pond in blue, the gray is the, the tailings dam. And then these, this orange, orangey type area is the displacements on the, the downstream space measured from the satellite. So you can see, um, I've, I've take, deliberately taken out the actual displacements which are in here, but the, 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 the more orange it is, the bigger the displacement. And then, you know, have been studies to show that you can perhaps use these together with in situ monitoring to improve the lead time of when something's going to happen, or at least to flag up um, earlier than um, in situ measurements might give you. And the other thing, I mean, it isn't the case with Brumandino, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there's many tailing stands that have been abandoned that are in remote locations in countries which don't have a lot of money really to monitor them. So for those type of structures, this could be um, a very useful system. Um, and what else has been happening? I mean, since the, since the Brumandino tailings dam disaster two years ago, there's been something called the Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management, uh, led by the International Council on, on Mining and Minerals, a United Nations Environment Programme and Principles for Responsible Investment. And that was really driven by investors. There were a lot of big investors who realized that they were making big investments, you know, pen big pension funds and various other investments with mining companies. And they really woke up to the fact that this just was unacceptable. They're investing in these companies where they've got these big tailing stands around the world. It's not just in low income countries that are failing, uh, leading to loss of life, permanent damage to the environment, in some case, loss of livelihoods. So um, this global industry standard on tailing stands set out a, a, you know, a number of I suppose good practices for tailing stands, which they which mining companies are being encouraged to sign up for, including, as you see there on that slide, emergency response and long-term recovery. So assessing the risks better, you know, as long as it, together with all the other things you'd expect, which is improved design, construction, monitoring, engagement with stakeholders, um, and also putting together a, a knowledge base so there's better knowledge of where these some of these structures actually are. Um, and that, so that really concludes just a, a few acknowledgements at the end, because there's a, a number of people involved in this work, uh, not just Mark and myself. So there's Richard Boddy there from HR Wallingford, who, um, who did the mud flow modelling. Um, um, Gregor uh, Petkovshek, who uh, is the brains behind the, the breach modelling and producing in Bray and Mud. Um, and then I have to acknowledge BC Hydro, who initially... Um, developed the life safety model. We took it over, I think, in 2008 and been, been developing it since then, but they, they were the initiators of that. And Steve Spittle, who at the time isn't now, but was at the Satellite Application Scatterbolt and the UK Space Agency, who provided some funding. And then uh, Mark Bales and Steve Flood of DHI, who I know gave uh, Richard quite a lot of useful advice for the, for the mud flow modeling. 
And then just finally, um, a few further readings, and I think um, Barbara will be giving you these links in the, in the chat. Um, so there's a paper that, that we wrote called Modeling the Brumandino Tailings Dam Failure and Subsequent Loss of Life and how that could have been, in, been reduced. Uh, that's an open access paper, so you can download that for free. That came out um, at the beginning of this year. Um, there's another paper, which I think is, there's a, a preprint copy of, available on, um, on ResearchGate that discusses the potential to use satellites to uh, monitor tailings dams. And then if you want a bit more information about DAMSAT, which is the project which was based on using um, satellites to monitor tailings dams in Peru, then there's more information at that um, website. And then uh, dam breach models. We, we, as I said, over the last 30 years, HR Wallingford has done a lot of research into dam breach models, um, some of which are available for free from our dam breach site. Um, the Embraer mud, I don't think is, is up there yet because it, it's, it's still being further developed, but that's, that's quite a new development to have that um, two flow um, breach model that can, can um, produce hydrographs for tailings dams. And then that's kind of brings us to the end. So we've got, a, I think, a bit of time for questions if there are any, which hopefully we'll be able to answer between uh, Mark and myself. But I'll just give the caveat that we're not geotechnical engineers. So if you've got any questions about embankment dams and failures, then we certainly won't be able to answer them. But anyway, we'll do our best. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Mark, that for, what was a really interesting discussion. Um, as Darren just mentioned, all of the um, links Barbara's kindly put in the chat, so do feel free to um, have a look at those or copy them somewhere to have a look at later. Um, in terms of questions, I, am, I believe we've got two through. So uh, we've got Manuel, um, who asks, congratulations for their very interesting presentation. I have a question regarding the LSM model. How detailed does the landscape or city have to be drawn in the model in order to get reasonable results? Shall I answer or do you want to answer, Mark? Shall I answer first? Yeah, you can, you can have the first. <laughs> and then Mark, it's um, a good question. How, how detailed does it have to be? Uh, it's probably sort of the standard answer to these questions. It depends. So, um, if you've got a city and we have we have done some modeling or Mark's done some modeling on some areas where you've got about 50,000 people, um, then you probably need to have a more detailed setup. So, you know, there's more houses, uh, more road networks, uh, more refuges. I think probably in the Brumandino case, because relatively speaking, there weren't that many people at risk compared to some of the models we've done. It was a relatively simple setup, but it does help. It does help to have the road networks and the paths. I mean, the in the case of Brumandino, we had to digitize these. Normally, we would use a, a digitized data set of buildings and roads and pathways, but because the Brumandino case was very simple, it it didn't take too long to digitize them. I don't know if you. It's probably worth Mark adding to that answer. Yeah, sure. It, it, similar to what Darren said, in, in more complicated or in sort of bigger cities, then the the level of detail around no, the road network and the um, buildings um, can add quite a lot of complexity. Um, in many cases, the road networks can be, or a, a, a sort of version of a road network can be, um, obtained from sort of open street map or other sources and then a bit of cleaning done it is possible depending on i guess in very large areas that you can in the model aggregate certain things together so you could aggregate blocks of buildings in a city together and have lots of people located in in one area that then evacuate it it would depend on the use of the model so if you're if you're using it to um investigate evacuation timings and large mass scale evacuation um using vehicles then the the most important thing will probably be the road network and the approximate starting locations of the people because the the um 
overall evacu evacuation time would largely be controlled by the um, sort of traffic density on the roads rather than the exact detail of, of each house. Thanks, Mark. Um, I hope that's answered your question, Manuel. We've got, I'm conscious of time, and we've got a few more questions coming in, which is great. Um, so I'll go through to one that's been uh, asked by Claire. Uh, very interesting presentation, thank you. How many tailings dams are there in the UK? How large are they and how are they managed? Are regulations similar to the Reservoir Act requirements for safety standards? Uh, good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer to this, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they are, but there's probably someone else out there who, who would know better than me. Um, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know how many there are in the UK. I mean, there was, um, some of you may be aware, there was... Um, one that sort of hit the headlines in the in the early 90s, I think it was around 92, 93, was a, a tailings dam called uh, Wheel Jane down in Cornwall, which had been a, a tin mine that had been, um, I think, opened in the mid 1800s and then shut and open, then shut and open. I think it had been reopened in 1969 or something. But the reason I mentioned that it was that that was that was that's fairly well known in the UK because there was an issue with acid dr mine drainage which is another thing you can sometimes potentially monitor with satellites which is a big problem if, so even if dams don't fail you can get leaching and, and um, of, of either the pollutants within them or acid mine drainage which has a significant effect on the environment so um, apologies I haven't really answered your question but yeah I mean I think that, that, that I imagine they do fall under the reservoirs act that well, they must do um, but I'm not sure how many there are, actually, to be honest. I don't know. I'll have to find out. I think we've actually got an answer from Craig Goff in the chat there. So oh, Thanks, um, Craig. My colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Craig has, uh, Craig has uh, got our back there. Thanks for that, Darren. I'll move on to the next question um, from Frederick. Does the LSM model include constraints on escape routes, like queues to get out of car parks? So constraints. Mark's question. probably best to answer that one, aren't you, Mark? Are you there, Mark? Are you on mute? Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Um, it can do, it doesn't necessarily, in the, if you, um, if you had a lot of vehicles leaving from a, a, an area to be a car park, then assuming there was, say, one road leading out, it would start the queue forming on that on that um, constraint road exiting the car park. So if you had lots of vehicles trying to leave at one time, then it would be the um, sort of capacity on the on the road exiting where you would see the queue forming in the model. And just to add to that, you do get you get queues at intersections. So so. You, you could put a constraint coming out of a car park if, if one wanted to, I think, in the model is, is yeah. Great. Thanks, Darren, Mark. Um, I'll move on to the next one. There's lots coming in now, which is fantastic. Um, does the model, this is from Ryan, does the model consider any congestion by those evacuating? And is there a randomness built, uh, built in for the human factor? So does it consider any congestion? And is there a randomness built in for the human factor? So the you know the model sort of explicitly models the congestion um, on the road networks. So it has a a, a, well, a simplified traffic model compared to um, the sort of very detailed traffic planning models. But it it does then model congestion as the um, the density of cars increase on particular roads or intersections joining where roads join. So you get the queues forming at those locations. Um, in terms of randomness, there is some randomness in there, but not much in that it, it works by trying to di direct people um, evacuating um, towards um, targeted safe locations, the, basically the shortest, closest ones. Um, there are options to put in randomness over like route choice and things.
Uh, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, hope that answers your question, Ryan. Um, next question we've got from Mark. Uh, thanks for this presentation. Very insightful. To what extent would 3D modeling of tailings, dam breaches, multi-layer non-Newtonian fluids help with defining safe zones and emergency response? Uh, this is a, probably a bit outside our comfort zone. I mean, I think, I think in terms of um, in terms of the life safety model, I think it would help if you could get a more accurate hydrograph, because the life safety model is is driven by um, a two, as Mark said, a two the outputs of a two D either you know. Um, mud flow or hydraulic model so i'm not sure there's much advantage in in having a a 3d output but i think there, there could be well be an advantage if you've got a uh, uh, an improved accuracy or or evidence-based um tailings dam breach model and you're getting a more accurate hydrograph because there's going to be a lot of different uncertainty you know a lot big uncertainties in 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 the in the mud flow hydrograph that's um yeah, that that's that's kind of a given, I suppose. Unless, yeah. Excellent. So, thanks, thanks, Darren. Um, next question we've got one from Emily. Does the LSM consider if people don't know where to evacuate, or do the agents progress directly to the refuge location? Uh, shall I answer? Well, I mean, they, they do yeah. use the least cost to go to the nearest refuge. I mean, um, there, there are various factors that you, you can put in to change that. So that there's um, one thing, it, you know, that the speed at which people move out, you can group people into families and then I think they move at the slowest, the rate of the slowest person. You can also set what times they, they how long it takes before they actually react to a warning. So if they get a warning, um, you know, how long does it take before they leave? Um, and the other thing that we've done, this isn't quite answering the question, I know, is looked at, at the, the sort of un uncertainties in the characteristics of the people, because one, one of the characteristics that affects your st stability in a, in a flood or a mud flow is um, generally how tall you are and how much you weigh from the, from the empirical data. So we've looked at that, that type of characteristics of people and varied those. So, um, it's generally going to the people are going to the nearest shelter, but there are various uncertainties that it's worth taking into account. And, and you can move the shelters around fairly easily. And I think I'm right in saying, Mark, that there's a limited capacity. You can limit the capacity of shelters, can't you? I think. Yeah. So if, if you're, if you're sort of having shelters, small shelters, potentially even within the in flood zones or just outside, you can limit capacity. And then once those fill and move off toward next, available or closest shelter from that point um, and all the um, directions to the from different points on the road network change when once um, they become full and often from a, from a using the model in a sort of planning context you often consider that a certain percentage of people may refuse to evacuate so in terms of running the model you often look at um, different scenarios and variations on sort of responsiveness, so either in the time it takes or whether people respond at all to a warning. Thanks both. Um, hope that answers your question, Emily. Um, I'm looking at ones that have been bumped up the chain because of likes. Um, and the top one is actually, is there a trial version of Damsat available that we can play with to see how it works or if there's a demo available? Um, uh, Craig, my colleague Craig has responded to that um, and I'll put his email address in the chat. So if you're interested, please do send an email to Craig and um, that's in the chat there. So please do get in touch. Thanks for that. Um, and the next one that's been bumped up uh, by Mark, it's got a like, so we'll answer this one. Hi, Darren, and many thanks for your comprehensive presentation. I would like to stick to emergency G fantasy documents, which in fact, in case of dams, should follow a strict policy guideline of guidelines of governance. Does it mean the latter are in many aspects of dam safety procedures negligent? Oh, oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I have to be careful. I say this, this is being recorded. I, I think it's, I, I think there's certainly not adequate. And I, I don't think that's just a case that, you know, as I said, it's not, I don't want to just focus on Brazil because there's, there's cases in the UK where uh, maybe emergency planning, not necessarily for dams, but for floods, could be improved. So I think um, I think 
yeah, I mean, whether there's negligence, yeah, there, there possibly is in some cases, to be honest. I mean, if, if you look at um, some of the quotes from Brazilian stakeholders, which are in peer review papers, there, there are some indications from people that they're saying, well, these are just a bit of a tick box exercise. But as I sort of mentioned, that's that, that's the case for a lot of um, high or, not, or, 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 or some high hazard either installations, whether they're nuclear power stations or, or some dams. So um, I think there is a need to improve it. And yeah, there is some negligence somewhere, I think. I mean, um, yeah, in some cases there is. I'd better not say any more really, but there's definitely a need to do more robust emergency planning. And I think to use more sophisticated tools because you're never going to get the exact answer in terms of the risk, but you are, it may throw up some solutions that you may not be aware of. So I'm just thinking of um, some colleagues of ours or, or, or people in the sort of life safety model community who did some work um, to look at tsunamis off the um, west coast of Canada. And there's some places you do, you don't get a very long warning. If there was an earthquake, you'd maybe get 35 minutes of a, a five or 10 meter high tsunami barreling towards the coast. And in some parts, of Canada, of that Canadian coast, it's not obvious where you would go because the terrain is such, there isn't a great difference in the vertical elevation. And they use the life safety model to basically show, well, if there's a tsunami warning, then you should stop your car in this, this, this stretch of road, rather than driving further to what, what is higher ground, you're actually okay if you stop here. So I think there's generally a need to, to do more, you know, spend more money on emergency planning because then you reduce the risks and it does sometimes appear to be a bit of a an afterthought maybe but uh, the emergency planners might disagree with me thanks darren um, i'm conscious of time because we've only got three minutes left um so i'll just go through some of the top ones we probably have time for maybe one more question um one just a very interesting presentation thanks uh thanks for that ruth but it's really nice to hear um, I'll just answer the top one I've got here on my list. With such a quick failure for the dam, what monitoring system would you recommend to provide a 15-minute warning? Would satellite monitoring be frequent enough to raise the alarm? Uh, no, well, that's the... Yeah, I mean, I, 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 that's why I put the caveat in about not being an expert on geotechnics. Um, I mean, uh, it, it was... The, you know, there, there was some discussions about what that state of that dam was in. I mean, there was the, there was in situ monitoring equipment um, and whether satellites could do it. As I said, there's some case studies which, which you know, we've been involved in, others have been involved in, which would indicate that they possibly can. I mean, it's, it's, not, um, it's not the one solution. It's, if you're using satellites, then you should be ideally using it in combination with in situ. So, it, it may flag up some warnings. And I think what it what the satellite gives you, which you may not get from the monitoring, is an eye in the sky. I know it sounds a bit sort of scary, um, but you get a you can get an independent view of the deformation, whereas you may not, the, the mining company or the the owner of a dam or a structure may not be releasing the data if you're say an environmental regulator. So, you know, um, yeah, again, sorry, not really a comprehensive answer. I don't think there's there's, there's one particular answer to that question of, of what could have given that 15 minute warning. It's possible that maybe satellites might have helped. I mean, there are some papers that indicate it could, but it it's a bit of a moot point, really, when you're being wise in hindsight. And, you know, it, 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 it involves quite a lot of processing to see if something untoward is happening from the data. Thanks, Darren. Um I'm conscious of time now. It's 12.59, so I don't think, unfortunately, we don't have any time to take any more questions. So I just want to wrap up So before we finish off. Um, please do take note of the chat. Barbara has done a great job putting in lots of links and contacts that in there uh, for DAMSAT, the link to the paper that Darren and Mark have authored. Um, I've also put Craig's email address in there if any of you are interested in um, getting in touch to learn more about DAMSATs. Um, there's also lots of information there about future SIMO events, and mentoring and training that's coming up. But for now, I just want to say thanks again to Darren and Mark for the um, excellent and engaging um, webinar. And uh, thanks again to SIWEM and uh, the RCG for hosting us uh, this lunchtime and just have a great rest of the day. And 
speak to you soon.